land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't fence me in. When the Emperor Was Divine by Julia Tsuka. Chapter titled, When the Emperor Was Divine. In the beginning, the boy thought he saw his father everywhere, outside the latrines, underneath the showers, leaning against the barrack doorways, <clears throat> playing go with the other men in their floppy straw hats on the narrow wooden benches after lunch. Above them, blue skies, the hot midday sun, no trees, no shade, birds. It was 1942, Utah, late summer, a city of tar paper barracks behind a barbed wire fence on a dusty alkaline plain high up in the desert. The wind was hot and dry and the rain rarely fell and wherever the boy looked, he saw him. Daddy, Papa, Father, Adosan. For it was true, they all looked alike. Black hair, slanted eyes, high cheekbones, thick glasses, thin lips, bad teeth, unknowable, inscrutable. That was him over there, the little yellow man. Three times a day, the clanging of the bells, endless lines, the smell of liver drifting out across the black barrack roofs, the smell of catfish, from time to time the smell of horse meat, on meatless days the smell of beans, inside the mess hall the clatter of forks and spoons and knives, no chopsticks, an endless sea of bobbing black heads, hundreds of mouths chewing, slurping, sucking, swallowing, and over there, in the corner beneath the flag, a familiar face. The boy called out, Papa! And three men with thick metal rimmed glasses looked up from their plates and said, Nandesu ka? What is it? But the boy could not say what it was. He lowered his head and skewered a small Vienna sausage. His mother reminded him once again not to shout out in public and never to speak with his mouth full. Harry Yamaguchi tapped a spoon on a glass and announced that the head count would be taken on Monday evening. The boy's sister nudged him under the table hard with the scuffed toe of her Mary Jane. Papa's gone, she said. They had been assigned to a room in a barrack in a block not far from the fence. The boy, the girl, their mother. Inside, there were three iron cots and a pot-bellied stove and a single bare bulb that hung down from the ceiling. A table made out of crate wood. On top of a rough wooden shelf, an old Zenith radio they had bought they had brought with them on the train from California. A tin clock, a jar of paper flowers, a box of salt. Tacked to the wall beside a small window, a picture of Joe DiMaggio torn from a magazine. There was no running water and the toilets were half a block away. Far away on the other side of the ocean, there was fighting and at night the boy lay awake on his straw mattress and listened to the bulletins on the radio. Sometimes in the darkness, he heard noises drifting from other rooms the heavy thud of footsteps, the shuffling of cards, over and over again the creaking of springs. He heard a woman whispering, lower, lower, there, and a man with a high voice singing, a feeder saying, sweetheart, and Wiederwach. Some, someone said, just say sayonara, Frank. Someone said, bonsoir. Someone said, please shut up, please. Someone else belched. There was a window above the boy's bed, and outside were the stars and the moon and the endless rows of black barracks all lined up in the sand. In the distance, a wide empty field where nothing but sagebrush grew, uh, then the fence and the high wooden towers. There was a guard in each tower and he carried a machine gun and binoculars and at night he manned the searchlight. He had brown hair and green eyes, or maybe they were blue. And he had just come back from a tour of the Pacific. On their first day in the desert, his mother had said, Be careful. Do not touch the barbed wire fence, she had said, or talk to the guards in the towers. Do not stare at the sun. And remember, never say the emperor's name out loud. The boy wore a blue baseball cap, and he did not stare at the sun. He often wandered the fire break with his head down and his hands in his pockets, looking for seashells and old Indian arrowheads in the sand. Some days he saw rattlesnakes sleeping beneath a sagebrush. Some days he saw scorpions. Once he came across a horse skull bleached white by the sun. Another time an old man in a red silk kimono with a tin pail in his hand who said he was going down to the river. 
Whenever the boy walked past the shadow of a guard tower, he pulled his cap down low over his head and tried not to say the word. But sometimes he, it slipped out anyway. Hirohito, Hirohito, Hirohito. He said it quickly, quietly, quickly. He whispered it. On the train ride into the desert, he had slept with his head in his sister's lap and dreamed he was riding an enormous white horse by the sea. When he looked out toward the horizon, he could see three black ships out on the water. The ships had sailed all the way over from the other side of the ocean. The emperor himself had sent them. Their sails were white and square and filled with wind, and their masts were straight and tall. He had watched as they slowly turned toward the shore. Then he was awake, and the train was rocking from side to side, and in the seat behind him a woman was quietly singing. It was dawn, and his sister was sound asleep. She was wearing her yellow summer dress and the little, with the little white flowers, because in the desert where they were going, it would be summer a lot. It was not like any desert he had read about in the books. There were no palm trees here, no oasises, no caravans of camels slowly winding across the dunes. There, were only, there was only the wind and the dust and the hot burning sand. In the afternoon, the heat rose up from the ground in waves. The air above the barracks shimmered. It was 95 degrees out, 100, 110. Old men sat outside on the long, narrow benches, not talking, whittling away pieces of wood as they waited for the hours to pass. The boy played marbles on the laundry room floor. He played Chinese checkers. He roamed through the barracks with the other boys in his block, playing cops and robbers and war. Kill the Nazis! Kill the Japs! On days when it was too hot to go out, he sat in his room with a wet towel over his head and leafed through the pages of old life magazines. He saw the bombed out cities of Europe and the Allied soldiers in Burma fleeing to India through the hot, steamy jungle. His sister lay on her cot for hours, staring transfixed at white majorette boots and men in their bathrobes in the Sears and Roebuck catalog. She wrote letters to her friends on the other side of the fence, telling them, telling them all she was having a good time. Wish you were here. Hope to hear from you soon. Their mother darned socks by the window. She read. She made them paper kites with tails woven out of potato sack strings. She took a flower arranging class. She learned to crochet. It's something to do. And for one week, there were, do there were doilies under everything. Mostly, though, they waited for the mail for the news, for the bells, for breakfast and lunch and dinner, for one day to be over and the next day to begin. When the war is over, the, boy, the, mother, the boy's mother told him, we can pack up our things and go home. He asked her when she thought that might be. In a month, maybe? Two months? A year tops? She shook her head and looked out the window. Three young girls in dirty white frocks were playing ladies in the dust. <clears throat> oh, bother. They cried out, and hello, I have, have some tea. And in the distance, there were ravens riding the updrafts. There's no telling, she said. On the other side of the wall, by his bed, lived a man and his wife, and the wife's elderly mother, Mrs. Cato, who, who talked to herself night and day. She wore a pink flowered house dress and tiny white slippers, and she carried a cane. And in the evening after supper, the boy often saw her standing in the doorway, with a small wicker suitcase, trying to remember the way home. Did she go to the left on Ward, or to the right on Grove? Or was it right on Ward and left on Grove? And when they had taken all the street signs, and when had they taken down all the street signs anyways? Whose bright idea was that? Should she continue to wait for the bus, or should she just start walking? And when she finally got there, then what? The daffodils, the boy called out to her softly. Oh yes, of course, I must remember to plant the daffodils, and the fence still needs mending. She said she could hear her mother calling for her in the distance, but that lately her voice had begun to sound farther and farther away. I, get that. I guess that's to be expected, she said. She said, oh well, and so it goes. She said, there's something strange about this place, but I can't figure out what it is. She said, everyone here seems so serious. The man scrubbing pots and pans in the mess hall had once been the sales manager of an import-export company in San Francisco. The janitor had owned a small nursery in El Cerrito. 
The cook had always been a cook. The kitchen's a kitchen. It's all the same to me. The waitress had worked as a live-in domestic for a wealthy family in Atherton. The children still write me every week asking me when I'm coming home. The man standing in front of the latrine shouting out, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! had been a vagrant in the streets of Oakland. That's him, the hallelujah guy. The old woman who did nothing but play bingo all day long had worked in the strawberry fields of Mount Eden for 25 years without taking a single vacation. Me happy come here, better than Mount Eden. No cook, no work, just do laundry fine. One evening as the boy's mother was hauling back a bucket of water from the washroom, she ran into her former housekeeper, Mrs. Ueno. When she saw me, she grabbed the bucket right out of my hands and insisted upon carrying it home for me. You'll hurt your back again, she said. I tried to tell her that she no longer worked for me. Mrs. Ueno, I said, here we're all equals, but of course she wouldn't listen. When we got back to the barracks, she set the bucket down by the front door, and then she bowed and hurried off into the darkness. I didn't even get a chance to thank her. Maybe you can thank her tomorrow, said the boy. I don't even know where she lives. I don't even know what day it is. It's Tuesday, Mama. Land, lots of land under starry skies above. Don't fence me in. Let me ride through the wide open country that I love. Don't.